For a couple of years now, the, SNIS, the Swiss Network for International Studies has been awarding a prize for the best thesis in international studies. Today I am with Ayla Berman, who is the winner of the 2015 edition. So congratulations on that. The jury has been full of praise for your thesis. It's timely, it's topical. Um, but before going into the details, could you just please introduce yourself and maybe also uh, say how you came to write that particular thesis. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for your kind words and thank you very much to SNIS for having granted me the award. I'm very grateful. Um, in terms of my background, I started out as a lawyer working in big law firms, but I really like research, so I decided to get a PhD. And now I'm a research fellow at the Graduate Institute here in Geneva, and next year I'll be teaching at the National University of Singapore Law School. Uh, in terms of the topic, uh, the title of the thesis is Reigning in the Regulators, Transnational Regulatory Networks and Accountability. Networks of regulators had been very much criticized for their accountability deficits, and I decided to take a, a closer look at that question in the thesis. And it, it was an interesting topic to me because it's related to the bigger question of the accountability of global governance, and there hadn't been enough or sufficient research on on regulatory networks. For practitioners working in international organizations, accountability and cooperation are just base principles. They don't even need to discuss that. But maybe for the general public, uh, could you elaborate on what you mean by that and why it's so important? All right. I think we first need to understand that global governance has undergone an evolution. In the period after World War II, intergovernmental, formal intergovernmental organizations were set up like the UN, the World Health Organizations, later on the WTO, so the ones everyone knows. But in the past two to three decades, uh, with increased globalization, growing interdependence between states and the rise of private actors, we see a rise of new kinds of global bodies which are informal and often smaller. So to give you examples, we see multi-stakeholder partnerships, which are partnerships of public and private stakeholders, like the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria, or ICANN, which sets internet standards. And so within this whole space of global governance, many of these bodies, the traditional former ones and the newer ones, are many of them are in the business of issuing norms. These um, norms have a lot of power and a lot of effects often significant effects on people on the ground. So just to give you a recent example, um, around two weeks ago, the WHO came out with a recommendation saying that it was okay for Brazil to uh, keep the Olympics despite the Zika crisis. So, you know, to me, I think, what if they would have come with the opposite uh, recommendation, the effect on Brazil and the companies that, that are so invested in this, on the athletes? So the point is really that even though they're legally non-binding norms, these global bodies have a lot of power and therefore they should be accountable towards those that are affected by their actions and the decisions they make should be made according to good decision-making procedures. Well, thank you very much. That was interesting. So now you've given us kind of the broader framework and with that in mind, could you now turn towards uh, why the networks of regulators are so important? First, perhaps just a little bit of introduction, what these networks actually are. So um, transgovernmental or transnational regulatory networks are, uh, regula are networks of regulators, of regulatory authorities that cooperate with their counterparts in other countries. And what's interesting coming from, you know, from a global governance or um, law perspective is that traditionally inter international cooperation was mostly between states and diplomats and the formal intergovernmental organizations. And now it's those networks. Yes, now it's actually bu bureaucracy, so yeah. subunits of the state which are actually cooperating with each other. Um, I think these networks um, or regulatory cooperation in general, international regulatory cooperation, is becoming increasingly important. Uh, one of the main reasons is that countries have realized that the main barrier to trade are no longer tariffs, but actually the different regulations between the countries. And they are now focusing on trying to 
remove those um, regulations or converging between the regulations. And we see that in the TTIP, which is now being negotiated. But we need to understand that these very technical rules often have significant political, impact. social, exactly, impacts. Um, and therefore the accountability or who sits at the table and makes the decisions on these standards actually matters. So just to give you an example from, the, from um, my PhD, I was looking at a network of the, of the, called the International Conference on Harmonization, which is a network of drug regulatory authorities, which issues, which harmonizes standards um, on drug re registration. And I show in, in the, in the um, thesis how these standards, because of the cost they impose, they actually um, risk the production, to re reducing the production of generic medicines, which in fact has an, an, an effect on access to drugs in developing countries. And there are also many studies that show that um, they have had effect on the development of drugs for neglected diseases, which are terrible diseases in developing countries, which most drug companies are not developing drugs for because there's no market. That's well known, yeah. And so this also has, you know, has actually reduced uh, drug development there. Okay, thank you for that. So they have a huge impact, I understand that. But you've looked at these networks of regulators. Um, so tell me about kind of the core of what you looked at and what you found in terms of accountability. The early research on regulatory networks was basically saying there are agencies on the loose. Um, everything is happening behind closed doors. There's no access to the public. Um, no domestic oversight so the picture was pretty bad and so i wanted to look at it a little bit closer uh, most of the empirical work that had been done on this topic was in the financial area so i decided to look at networks in the health area which had not been studied at all so that was my focus what i found was that actually the picture was not as bad as portrayed to be in the literature at that time, and also that the networks have undergone a development, a gradual development towards more accountability over the years. Um, so I'll tell you about three main findings um, that I have in the thesis. So first of all, if we look at the standard development processes, we see that actually there had always been a notice and comment process, which means that the public in principle had the possibility Same to have a say in the process, some kind of say, but there w it wasn't completely closed, that's, that's the main point. Um, so that was one uh, main finding. Another one was that actually these networks, they started out as clubs, that is true, they were uh, very limited in their membership, the US, Europe, Japan, but over the years they have opened up and found ways to integrate new um, countries emerging country mostly, like Brazil and India. So we do see this kind of development within the networks. And the third aspect was really that there was domestic oversight. So these, the International Co Co Cooperation of Regulators was actually subject to the same kind of oversight mechanisms that existed for their domestic activities. And also increasingly, as their international activities are becoming a core part of their work, you know, we also see reforms at the domestic level introducing a little bit more of oversight. From what you're saying, it's like it's improved, it's much better than you thought. So everything is fine, right? <laughs> well, not exactly. I mean, the, the argument I make, it's better than the early um, research, but the situation is really far from perfect yet. Despite procedures, having procedures in place, it does, still doesn't mean people are actually making use of it. So it doesn't mean that actually the public voice, the voice of the more vulnerable stakeholders, of those more marginalized, say, you know, the example I gave of neglected diseases, that it's necessarily heard. That's not the case. So we do have this gap. Um, a second issue is that, you know, we see this opening up. It looks great. You know, we're becoming more accountable. We're bringing in new members. But why? But why? So if you look, exactly, if you look into the why, then you see that it's basically the self-interest of the members that is leading to this openness because the members, you know, when they started out, the market was very limited to the members. But now, as everyone knows, you know, globalization, supply chains have moved emerging countries. So they basically want to diffuse their standards to other countries yeah. because it improves market access, because it helps them better supervise the import of products into their countries. Yeah. 
So basically, it's really about having those countries on board so they can diffuse their standards more Otherwise easily. Otherwise they would start their own. Exactly. Otherwise they would start alternative um, bodies with their own standards. So it's, it's mostly that. It's not so much about becoming a more just organization because, you know, if it would be... It's more like clubs becoming bigger clubs. Yes, exactly. And the third aspect, which to me is really a, an important aspect also, is the issue of the power of industry. Because industry is very strong on these networks. Regulators essentially depend on industry, certainly on these technical topics. Experts, right? Yes. They're always ahead of them in terms of, of, of the scientific knowledge. So they, they are there, but then, you know, they also have a strong influence on the development of standards, and these standards then are adopted at the domestic level. Okay, so I understand there is... Uh it's, it's better than you saw, but it's still not quite there in terms of accountability. Um, what would you take from the insights of your thesis um, uh, towards making recommendations for you know, improving global governance, governance and improving accountability in global governance? Uh, several issues. First of all, there should be good regulatory decision-making uh, procedures um, so those affected can actually have a voice. Um, issues like transparency also, which are preconditions for participation and oversight mechanisms. So that's, that's one set, and we increasingly see that in many international bodies, but that's something that should be further developed. A second issue, I think also lawyers need to keep in mind that we need to go beyond procedures, that if you really want to proact if we want to have engage stakeholders that are weaker, that are more vulnerable, we need to proactively reach out to them because they have barriers of participation. Um, which prevent them from actually effectively participating. Um, Codex is an example. It has a trust fund, which it essentially by which it helps developing countries participate in its procedures. Build the skills necessary yes. to actually meaningfully yes. participate. Exactly, yeah. that's the goal to build, help them build capacity to participate. Um, another aspect is the engagement of non-state actors. Like I said before, in, in the case of industry, we have also risks involved. Um, risks of capture and um, so non-state actors are increasingly participating in global governance and they bring many benefits they bring expertise they bring knowledge and um, but at the same time their involvement brings in risks and we need to find a way to balance that uh, the WHO recently adopted a framework for engagement with non-state actors where it addresses this issue, how to engage non-state actors while it's managing the risk. Kind of a good practice on how to deal with these people. Yes, to not, to not be considered captured and not to be un unduly influenced, but we'll have to follow and see how that works in practice. Uh, and the third aspect really in the case of regulatory networks is that we have the advantage is that they're, they're bound by domestic law, they're bound by domestic administrative law. So that is another tool which countries can use to um, monitor their own domestic okay, interests. Okay, so kind of from the national and from the international exactly. level, so you exactly. have both means of com better controlling and... Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Well, thank you very much. That was very interesting. And congratulations again for, for this achievement. I hope many people will be um, curious to read your PhD. Uh, but also thank you very much for having it made it uh, more accessible through this kind of uh, intervention here in a park. Thanks. Thank you very much.